Now here, in example 11, it says which scenario represents an exponential growth. All right, well, first, before we start uh, looking at our options, we, we have to see what kind of a, what is an exponential growth? So there's two types of growth that you will see in algebra one, which is a linear growth. What, what a linear growth is, when uh, where the increase you always increase by the same amount, or you increase by the same amount, or what we call a constant rate of change. All right. I mean, some examples are, let's say you, you start with one and then the next term is three. Then the next term is five. Then the next term is seven. The next term is six. So notice that here, this is a sequence that represents a linear growth because you're always increasing by the same number, which in this case, you're always going to be adding to. So this is what we have when it comes to a linear growth. But still, this is not what, we, what, we're, what we've been asked here because it says which scenario represents an exponential growth. All right, so now what is an exponential growth? Well, an exponential growth This is a type of growth that when you're increasing, you increase by some multiple or by multiplication so there is an increase, but now this increase, it's happening by some multiplication. Now, let's look at the different options that we have here. In example one, we see that a water tank has been filled at a rate of two gallons per minute. This, it's an example of a linear growth because here you're increasing by a constant rate. So this is not an example of an exponential growth because every minute you will be increasing by two gallons. So one minute, two gallons two minutes per gallon. So you're always going to be increasing by the same number or by the same amount. This is an example of a constant. It's an example of a linear growth due to the constant rate. So we don't want that. We're looking for exponential growth. So now let's look at here. A bind grows six inches every week. The same. This is you're, you're, you're increasing. Again, you're increasing by constant rate. because you're always increasing by the same amount, six inches per week. So we don't need this. Now let's look at uh, option three. It says a um, species of fly doubles its population every month during the summer. So let's, let's give an a scenario. Let's say you start with one. And then the next month you have two. Then the next month you have four, because again, we're doubling and the next one, you go, uh, what is it? You double it, you get eight. And the next one, 16, and so on. So, yes, you are increasing. But are you always increasing by the same number? No. Here, you increase by one. Here, you increase by two. Here, you increase by four. Here, you increase by 16. So, in this case, you're doubling. So, you have, you, you, you can model this this growth by some kind of a multiplication is two to some exponent. This is two to the first and, and so on. Two to zero, two to the first and so on. Um, so yes, this you're multiplying, you're increasing by some kind of a multiplication. So this is an example of an exponential growth. Now in question 13, it says, what is the minimum value of the function y equals 
x plus 3 minus 2. All right, well, let's make it easy for ourselves. The minimum value, at least if we're going to use the method of graphing, is the lowest y value in the graph. All right, well, let's see. Let's, let's graph this. And let's see what does the graph say. All right, so to graph it, we press y equals. For the absolute value, you can locate that. And you mathematics is right here. You go under math, then you go to number, and then you will hit ABS, which is absolute value. So we're gonna take the absolute value of x plus three. X is here, so x plus three. Close parenthesis minus two. Perfect. So this is the function that we want to see the graph of. Well, let's graph it. You press graph equals. All right. <clears throat> so let's see what we have here. This is our graph. It is obvious that the lowest y value, it's somewhere over here, which is definitely not a positive y value because this is all positive y values. The lowest y value here, it's a negative. So we can eliminate three and two because this is this point right here. This is my minimum, which is definitely not positive. It's negative. Now, what is it that we have here? Is it going to be positive or is it going to be a negative two or negative three? Well, let's see. One way for you to look at it, you can press second uh, right here. You cannot really see it, but it's under calc all on top of trace. So trace, you want to find the minimum value. So you go down, you press minimum, you press yes. You see that this it's, it's this point that is blinking and here it says left bound. Let's choose a left point of our minimum. We know that the minimum value is somewhere here. So let me choose a point on the left side and I press enter. Now, let me choose a point on the right side because now it's saying, well, give me the right bound. So I don't know, some point over here. And then you, you want me to guess? Yes. So here you have it. Your minimum is when X is equals to negative three and y equals negative 1.99. So with that said, we're looking at the minimum is the lowest, is the lowest y value. So look at the y value here. This is pretty close to negative two. So with that said, the correct option is negative two because the minimum is given to you by the y value, not the x value. Here they're trying to trick you here. The x is negative three, the y is negative two. Well. The minimum is given on the y value, so that's why we choose negative two. Okay. Moving on. If we see example 13 here, it says what type of relationship exists between the number of pages printed on a printer and the amount of ink used in that printer. Okay. So let's see, what do they mean by this? It says what type of relationship? Now you, you can have two types of relationship. One that has a positive correlation and one has a negative correlation. Now let's see what the scenario is saying. It says, what type of relationship exists between the number of pages printed on a printer and the amount of ink used by that printer? So think about it for a second here. The more pages you print, the more ink you will use. So if you want to use, you want to see it as some kind of a graph here, which is not straight, but you, you get the point. Now let's say in the bottom, we put pages and say that on the Y value, we put ink. So the more pages you print, the more ink you will use. So you can model this as some kind of an increasing point here. Notice that if we increase the number of pages that you're printing, your ink usage is also going to increase. So that's why we can have this kind of a model. Now look at this line. This line is a positive, it's a positive linear equation. Because of that, we have a positive correlation. So those that said negative, they're out. So now it's between one and two. 
Notice that the difference is that casual and not casual. For something to be a casual relationship, this means that one affects the other. Which is the case that we have here, because notice that the more pages we print, the more ink we will use. So if we stop printing pages, we will stop using ink. If we lower the number of pages, then we will lower the number of ink. So notice that when you affect one, or when you decide to do something with the pages, you will also will be affecting the ink because one is going to affect the other. And that is why it's a positive correlation and it's also casual because one is going to affect the other. The number of pages will affect the amount of ink that you're going to be using. Now, looking at example 14, it is a computer application generates a sequence of musical notes using the function. Okay, so we've been given some kind of a function here. That is great. It says where n is the number of nodes in the sequence and f of n is the note frequency in hertz. Which function will generate the same note sequence as f of n? Okay. So notice that we have here, we have f of n equals 6, 16 to the n. So we want to see which of these four options it's the same as f of n equals 6 over 16, 8. One thing to notice is this, 6 over 16 to the n. You can rewrite this function. How? Well, one thing to notice is the 16. Notice that 16, 16 you can represent that as 2 to the fourth. Well, let's see if that's true then. 2 exponent 4. That is 16. So instead of writing 16, we can write 2 to the 4th. So let's come back to the problem here. And instead of writing 16, we can write it as 2 to the 4th. Perfect. Now, why do we do this? Because now the rule of exponent says that you can multiply this too. So now this becomes 6, 2, to the 4 n. Let's look at the options that we have now. Look at the option that matches here is option two. Because all we did, we just rewrote the inside of the parentheses, which it happened to be 16. We did notice that 16, we can write as two to the fourth. So we came back, we rewrote it. The rule of exponent says that we can multiply these two exponents. Four times n is four n. That's the new exponent. And that is the one that is gonna match here. Now, for example, 15, We have which value of x is the solution to the equation 13 minus 36 x squared minus 12 x. All right, so let's see what we have here. Let's rewrite the function here on the bottom so we can have some space to work with. It's an ugly 13. So 13 minus 36 x squared. All right, so we want to find the solution or we want to isolate x. This is the only x that we have here. So in order to solve this, the first thing that you want to do is isolate the terms that do not have an x on it. So notice that here you have two terms. You have 13 and negative 36 x squared. So notice that 13 does not have an x on it. So what I'm going to do here, I'm going to cancel out the 13. I'm going to move it to the other side. So we do the opposite. Now they cancels. So now on the left side, you have negative 36 x squared equals, and this becomes negative 25. Okay, if you combine those two, you get negative 25. Notice that at least we're getting closer. Now, here you have negative 36 times x squared. Because you're multiplying, if you want to cancel out that negative 36, you got to do the opposite. And we know that the opposite of multiplication is division. So now we will divide by negative 36. cancels. 
So now we have x squared equals, we don't know what the number is, so I'm going to read it as 25 over 36. Okay. Um, let me continue the work here. So we have x squared equals 25 over 36. I just rewrote it so we can have some space here. All right. So this is what we have now. So what's next? Well, let's see. We want to solve for x. Notice that here we almost have x by itself. The only thing that is not letting us have the x by itself is this second exponent. Now, what we can do here, we can take the square root. Because the moment that you take the square root, this 2 is going to cancel out with the root. So now we have x equals the square root of 25 over 36. So let's look at our options. Oh, well, none of the options matches here. But one thing that I forgot to mention before we move forward is that when you're solving for x, if you're solving for x, if your last step is to take the square root, then you have a plus or minus. Okay. But still, we don't have square root of 25 or 36. But when it comes to square roots, the square root of a fraction is the same as the square root of the numerator and the square root of the denominator. Which, notice that the square root of 25 is 5. And the square root of 36 is 6. So now we have two answers. Either x is the positive 5 over 6, or x is the negative 5 over 6. This is the meaning of plus or minus, one positive, one minus. Um, so we know that it has to be 5, 6, or negative 5, 6. Not this, not this, not this, but this. Option 4 is the correct option, at least for this question. Question 15. All right. So let's look at it here now. In question 16, it says, which point is the solution to the system below? Okay. There are many ways to approach this problem, but I'm actually going to cheat a little bit here because I already know what the answer is. Uh, if you would like to actually find the solution of this, you will have to graph it. And you will have to see which of those points actually match that. Uh, but because of time, I'm going to tell you how you can just verify. So here, what I'm going to be, or how I'm going to approach this problem is that I'm going to be, I'm going to be choosing those solutions that I think are the correct answer. So, so let's see what happens in option four. Now, to see if it's a point of the solution, what that means is that when you plug it in, you get a true statement. Now, let's see, this is the value of x, and this is the value of y. So what we're going to do, we're going to plug in points and check for true statement. So I'm, I'm going to look at option four here. So let's look at the option four. So let's say, let's, let, let's check, because right now we're checking. Let's check what happens when it's negative three and two. So again, all we're doing, we're going to check the points by plugging it in. So we're going to get the first equation. And we're going to get the second equation. Okay. So the first equation is right here. So what we're going to do, we're going to get the first equation. Oh, I shouldn't call it equation. I should have called it inequality. All right, perfect inequality. We're going to get the first inequality, and we're going to check for a point. So this is x is negative 3, y is positive 2. So let me just check what happens here. Minus negative 12. I'm checking for x, which is negative 3. So notice that all I'm doing, I'm, I'm just literally just looking at the inequality, and I'm checking the points. And now for the second inequality, it's going to be positive 2 minus negative 6. I see an x. 
I'm going to plug in negative 3 plus 4. All right. So let's see what happens when I check this point. So here, just multiply 2 times 2. That's 4. Okay. I don't know why. There it is. 4. Negative 12 times negative 3. So that's positive 36 times 4. So now you have the 4 is less than 40, which is true. 4, it is less than 40. So now let's see what happens in the other case. So now we have 2 is less. Negative 16, I mean, I'm sorry, negative 6 times negative 3. That's positive um, 18 plus 4. You add them up. So now this is saying that 2 is equal to, I'm sorry, less than negative 22, positive 22. So this is true. So notice that when we plug in the second, the, the fourth point here, we get a true statement for the first inequality and the second inequality. So that means that option four, it is our solution because when we plug it in to both inequalities, we get a true statement. It is true that four is less than 40. And it's also true that two is less than 22. Because both inequalities give you a true statement, then we're going to call this our solution. You can check the other points and you will see that you will not get it correct. You will not get a true statement out of them. Now, if we look at example 17. In example 17, we have when the function f of x equals x squared is multiplied by the value of a, where a is negative, then what happens to the function a x squared? Okay. So what this question is trying to ask you is what happens when you multiply a quadratic equation by a positive number. Okay, so, well, let's see, because this is pretty much what they're saying. Look, look, we have this function, and they're asking us, well, if we have this function, what happens to it when we multiply it by a, negative, by a positive number? Because none of that is the same function, it's just there's an A in front of it, and an A happens to be positive. Well, let's actually see what's going to happen then. We have a graphing calculator. Let's see. If we erase this, let's see what, how is the first function x squared looking like? So if we graph x squared, we're going to get this function, which is fine. It's a quadratic open up. Nothing new. But now, let's put a positive number in front of it. I don't know. Just choose any positive number. I want to say 10. So now we have 10x to the second exponent. So notice what's going to happen. Here is the original. What do you notice when you multiply by a positive number? It is the same curvature, but there's a small difference. And that is that it has been squished or, is, or your graph is getting narrower. It's not wider. It's getting narrower. So it's still open it up. And when you multiply by a positive number, it gets narrow. So let's look at those options here. It's open upwards, but it gets wider. Nope, we said it was narrow. Opens upward and it's narrow. So here it is. So what happens here is that when you multiply by a positive number, all it does to the original graph is that it just squishes it or it just makes it more narrow. And what I mean by positive, I mean a positive greater than 1. All right, perfect. Now, let's see. In question 18, it says Andy has 310 on his account. Okay. Each week, which we're going to label W, he withdraws 30 bucks from his expenses. Now, the question is, which expression could be used if you wanted to find how much money 
will he be left after eight weeks? Okay. Let's actually see what's going to happen with his money. So let's make a table of values. So let's say, um, let me make this real quick here. Let me use technology. All right. So here's our table. And we're going to cut it in half. All right, assuming that that's half. Um, so let's say that here we're going to do W. And here we're going to put the money, which in some sense is X and Y. I want to see what's going to happen with his money when it comes to weeks. So in the zero week, he has $310. Because that's, that's how much he started with. Uh, and he has 310 in his account and each week he takes away 30. So on the zero week, he has everything, which is 10 weeks, uh, three, ten dollars So one week passed by, he withdraws 30 bucks. So now this 310, it becomes 280. Another week passes by. Now we are in week two. He takes away another 30. So now it becomes 250. Another week passes, passes by and now we get 220. Another week passes by and you get 190. And I'm not going to do that much here, but after the fifth week, he gets 160. And six week, it's 130. All right, perfect. We have a table of values here. What we can do is, well, let's actually graph each of those functions and see which one can actually give us this table of values here. So let's take it some options at a time here. Um, hold on, let me just move this table here. Okay. 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 All right. Um, all right. Good. Perfect. Because I need some space for the calculator. Perfect. So what we're going to do here, we're going to graph each of those functions. And we're going to see which one of those gives me this, this table over here, which we have. So let's get started. Let's clear it up. Let's clear it up. Let's clear it up. Let's look at option one, 310 minus 8x. Because again, w is x. So we look at the second table, table of values. Let's see, 0, 310, 1, 280. Nope, it says 1 is 302. So we know that this is not the correct option because it doesn't give me the table of values that I have here. So let's erase that. Let's look at option two. So 280 plus 30 parentheses x minus 1. So let's look at the table value. So we're going to hit second table. All right. Week zero. Well, I mean, just look at week zero. We can stop at week zero because I know that when x is zero, y should be 310 and here's saying that when x is 0 y is 250 so this is not true all right well let's look at option 4 280 minus 30 parentheses x minus 1 second table well let's look at the table value 0 310 we have it 1 280 we have it 2 250 we have it 3 to 20, we have it. Oh, well, I mean, you can see that it's the same table here. So in order that this function does give you the table that represents the scenario here. So that's saying that the correct option here is option four. Okay, well, moving on, we do have um, question 19. So here it is, question 19. Let's see what we have here. It says the daily cost of production in a factory is calculated by some function. Okay, so we have a function that calculates uh, the production in a factory where X is the number of completed products manufactured. Now, which set of numbers best describe the domain of C of X? Okay, so the word that stands out the most here is domain. Where domain, you can think about it as what you plug in to the function. Okay. 
which most of the times is going to be your x values. So, but what do we know about x values? We know that the x values, x is the number of completed or complete the products. It says right here, x is the number of complete products. All right. So let's see, integers. Can we use integers for x? Well, I will, I would say no, because integers does have decimal numbers. It can be 1.2, it can be 2, it can be 2.3, it can be negative, negative 1.5. But now let's see, how come we cannot use integers? Because can you really say, well, today I produce 1.2 products? No. Or can you say I produce negative 1.5 products? That does not make sense because we're looking at what X represents. So this is not true. Now, in here, oh, I'm sorry, integers. Integers are whole numbers. So, but the reason why it's not true because you can have negative two, negative three, zero, one, two, and so on. You can, you can take in consideration those, um, those negative numbers, real numbers. Those are the ones that can have um, decimals on them, but for the same reason as before, um, you can have one, you can have 2.3, all of the, all of the following are real numbers, uh, 5.2, we got four, we got 3.3 and so on. But notice that we cannot use positive real numbers for X because we cannot say, well, today I completed 5.2 cars or today I produce 3.3 cars. It just does not make any sense. Now, in, uh, let's look at the next option here. Now here, option three is telling you that we have positive rational numbers. Same idea, rational numbers are fractions. You cannot talk about fractions when it comes to completed numbers. And the Greek option here is option four. All right, last question here for this segment, question 20. So now let's, let's, let's look at what we have here. I'm gonna have to make this question a little bit smaller than usual so you can fit on the whole page. Um, okay. So here in question 20, they're telling us, now I conducted a survey on sports participant and he created the following two dot plots to represent the number of students uh, participating by age in soccer and basketball. Okay. So here we have two sports. The first graph or the first dot plot talks about soccer, uh, the ages of those who play soccer and the second dot plot talks about the ages of those who play basketball. So now here, the question is which statement about the given data set is correct. So we're looking for something that is correct. Now, let's look at what we have here. If we look at all the options here, well, let's take it one at a time here. So let's look at option A. It says the data for soccer players are skewed to the right. So let's look at soccer players here. For something to be labeled as Q to the right, your graph should look something like this. Most of the data should be on the left side, something along these lines. So we should have like dots around here. So it should be, most of the data should be on the left side. If you look at this, the, the how those dots are being distributed does not look anything like skewed to the right. So we know that this is not true. So now in example two says the data for soccer players have less spread than the data for basketball players. They're about the same. If, if we're gonna talk about spreadness, notice that both of them go from six to 12 and they seem to be scattered equally. So we know that here, 
is not example two. For option three, it says the data of basketball players have the same medium as the data for soccer players. And in option four, it says the data for basketball players have a greater mean than the data for soccer, soccer players. All right. So if we want to use option three, it says the data for basketball players have the same median. Okay. So let's compute the median. Let's compute the median for each one of them here. Uh, let's compute the median for soccer players. Now, to compute the median, you cancel one to the left and one to the right in pairs. So let's compute the median for soccer. I'm going to cancel this with one on the left, one on the left, with one on the right. One on the left. Now you start with the bottom one on the right. One on the left, one on the right, one on the left, one on the right left with right left with right left with right so now we have here that our medium are you have two points so notice that if we cancel another one in pairs everything's going to get canceled out so what we what we do here for the median we're going to add them up so this circle or this dot has a value of eight and this dot has a value of nine. You add them up, you divide it by two. So this is 17 divided by two, which is equal to 8.5. So at least the medium for soccer, it's 8.5. So now let's compute the medium for basketball. And again, we cross in pairs. So one on the left with one on the right. One on the left with one on the right. One on the left with one on the right. One on the left, we one on the right, left, right, left, right, left, right, left, right. We have them here. We got two tenths. Let's compute the medium. There's two points that are left. So there's going to be 10 plus 10 because each of those dots has a value of 10. You add them up, you divide by two, you get 20 divided by two. So this is 10. So the medium for soccer is 8.5 and the medium for basketball is 10. Now in here it says the data for basketball players have the same medium as the data for soccer, which this is false because we know that the medium is 8.5 for soccer and the medium for basketball is 10. So this is false and by order of elimination, the correct answer is option four.